originally from Ghana, sort of raised in different countries in Africa. So initially moved to Nigeria from Ghana, stayed there for a few years with my family, moved back to Ghana for a year, moved to Lesotho in the Trans Sky. The Trans Sky re-merged to South Africa. I've been here pretty much ever since. Um, this is home. And as far as what I do now, um, I guess I guess it's just basically the calling kind of taking root and not letting me go. Um, I ran away from it for years. Once I sort of began to understand the path that I was supposed to go down on, you know, it became easier to just go with the flow. So. Sure. Yeah. And how much did your childhood influence what you do now? My dad was a university librarian. Um, my mom was a, t a teacher um, and, a, and a principal as well. So um, I came from that kind of background, highly academic, a um, lot of books, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. son of a librarian. Sure. <laughs> um, and at the same time, you know, um, I was baptized into the Catholic faith. My dad was Catholic. And um, at some point, um, this was in my teens, he became born again. And we joined the Pentecostal movement. But prior to that, we'd been to charismatic churches, um, uh, Baptist churches, and Methodist churches. Like we pretty much, you know, ran the whole <laughs> sure, yeah. spectrum. And um, we settled in the Pentecostal movement. And that's kind of where um, I, grew, uh, I grew up and got really involved in in uh, the church, like the youth movement, uh, the church band, uh, Bible study, and the works. And then from there, it just kind of, I kind of fell off the wagon a little bit, mm -hmm. and we discovered. Um, I think we all do that at yeah. some point, right? You know, it's almost it's almost necessary, I guess, for you to find your way back. And what I did it was it was back in the charismatic uh, slash Pentecostal movement. This book is Notes to My Sister, Let Him Serve You. Yeah. Uh, is this your only book that you've got out now, or are yes. you working on anything else? Um, I'm working on some other stuff right now. I'm working on something for men, okay. um, also something for kids, uh, and something for couples as well. So it's, it's nothing is done as yet. Um, I keep um, stopping world. and restarting. You say in our society today that boys growing up do not have a strong role model because I grew up in Detroit mm -hmm. and I can tell you what I've seen yeah. and of course we're here in Joburg and mm -hmm. anywhere basically in the world anywhere where you've got boys growing up without a, a father figure yeah. would you say that influences our society as a whole and, and, and what happens when these, these boys become, become men? I think not having a father figure is one of the problems I think the other problem is um, they're inundated with a lot of supposed or so-called role models who aren't necessarily the most wholesome, the most um, beneficial to them. So a lot of a lot of kids without um, a father or father figure will replace that um, void with maybe a rapper or an athlete who right. is not necessarily Michael Jordan was one I'm <coughs> thinking from when I was growing up. See right there. Yeah. So so I mean. At least back then, you know, Jordan had class. Yes. So, you know, like which is the, different than the guys now. Which is different from the guys right. now. They don't know how to treat women. They don't know how to treat women. They don't know how to treat themselves. Well, or like, you even know, act in public, right? Basically, so yeah. it's 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 a very different um, um, standard that that they follow and that these kids emulate, and it's a problem. The issue here is is just I think an attack on the family structure, if you will. And I know the word attack sounds really dramatic. There's there are very few other words that I can use to describe what's happening right now. And when you look especially at the impact that that has on young boys and young men, specifically, I mean, they're the ones that society looks to to lead. Sure. You know, the impact is is, is catastrophic. What does it mean to serve? Her? Service basically is. Um, availing oneself to meet the needs of another. There are two key things here. First thing is let, which, which is permission from her. She needs to give him permission to do what he is supposed to do in her life or what she needs him to do in her life. And then the serving part, I think a lot of the time, especially you know, with the modern narrative around African men, it's almost seen as taboo for a man, almost unheard of for a man to serve a woman. And the reality is, if you're a leader, if you truly are a leader, then service should be second nature to you. 
Yes. It should be what you do by default. Let him serve you is basically let him lead you through service, not necessarily through through words and promises and unfulfilled claims, but rather through his actions, through his daily consistent application of practical practical love. And it can be big things or small things, right? It can be big anything. things, it can be small things. But when we talk about big things, I think a lot of the time people confuse big things with grand gestures. And the gesture might be nice, but usually those grand gestures happen every now and then. Yeah. And it, a relationship happens in the minutiae. So it's, it's a day-to-day -day thing. When you woke up in the morning, how considerate were you of her needs? How considerate were you of her situation in the workplace or in the house? What have you done to prepare her for her day? What have you done to make her that much more effective, not just in her capacity as um, an employee or a business owner or as a mother, whatever, but also as your lover? There's a lot of work that we as men have to do to prepare our women to give back to us. And we've learned over the years to just keep taking. Mm -hmm from women um, without necessarily giving back. And this is not speaking Or looking at women as someone to serve us. Exactly, you know, um, and serving in a subservient sense, not yeah. necessarily an empowering sense, you yeah. know, because women, women are supposed to serve men too, but it's more than just handing you dinner and, you know, bearing you kids. Um, women are, are, are counselors. You know, um, if I look at my life, for example, some of the most powerful voices in my life have always been female voices, whether it's my mom, my grandmother, my aunt, my sisters, uh, female sure. friends. A lot of my really powerful same here counsel comes yeah. from women because their focus tends to be on the family and sure. society and community. Whereas with guys, it's about the goal, you know, like how do I achieve the goal? So if I want advice on goals, I'll almost probably talk to guys. But when, when I want advice on how best to relate to the people that I'm supposed to be leading, chances are I'll, I'll bounce the ideas off a woman first to find out her her perspectives from a relational perspective before I go to a guy. You also speak to what, small groups, churches, schools, what? Um, pretty much anyone who needs who needs me to. So, so far it's, it's been mostly to um, women's groups. I, ha I have also done uh, men's groups, uh, but the demand usually seems to come from women's groups. And that's not necessarily because the guys don't want to hear what I have to say. It's just that we haven't organized enough, sure. I think, to a point where there are enough um, of those kinds of events happening for me to be invited to. Um, I'm on social media, um, official KOB on Instagram, um, Kofi Boating Live on Twitter. Um, Kofi Ofori Boateng on Facebook. And, yeah. Thanks for coming by. Appreciate you. Pleasure.